Thank you, sir. So we will directly jump into the immunotherapy part. So this is the advances in the adjuvant and neoadjuvant systemic therapy in resectable non-small cell lung cancer. So you can see Adora and Alina trials, and then in the adjuvant setting, for the immunotherapy perspective, we have IM Power 010 and we have Keynote 091. In the neoadjuvant setting, we have Checkmate 816, and in the perioperative setting, we have like a lot of other trials out there, like 671, 770, Neotorch, and Eigen. So first, quick overview of the phase three trials and FDA approvals for the immunotherapy part. In the neoadjuvant settings, the Checkmate 816, first we will give uh, neoadjuvant immunotherapy along with the chemotherapy just for three cycles, and then patient underwent surgery, and after that, the chemotherapy was optional, and then uh, FDA got approved for this regimen. And secondly, the adjuvant part, uh, IM power 010, patient underwent surgery, and after that, received chemotherapy, and then patient has received adesolizumab for duration of one year. And this is in PDL1 more than 1% patient, FDA approval. And second, Keynote 091, the chemotherapy was optional after surgery, and then patient received pembrolizumab for one year, and this approval was for the all comer irrespective of the PDL1 status. And the last one, that the perioperative regimens, multiple trials out there, but the Keynote 61671 got the FDA approval for pembrolizumab along with the chemotherapy for four cycles, followed by surgery, and in the adjuvant setting, we received pembrolizumab for nine months. That is a type of error. This is just for the nine months. So first we will deal with the new adjuvant part, that is Checkmate uh, 816. They have included according to the seventh edition, that is uh, stage 1b, more than or equal to 4 cm, up to stage 3a. Uh, EGFR mutation and ALK mutation patients are excluded. And patient received three cycles of nivolumab along with the chemotherapy and then underwent surgery. Uh, patient surgery need to be done within six weeks uh, post-treatment. So if you look at the, this was uh, recently presented in 2024 ASCO, they have mentioned that the four-year EFS update, there was almost a significant difference was there, uh, if you look at the four-year EFS data. In chemotherapy arm, it was only 38%, whereas in case of the near adjuvant plus uh, chemotherapy arm, it was uh, 49%, almost like 11% EFS uh, benefit was there. So if you can remember from the previous slides, like Adora has a 10% benefit in the uh, uh, EFS. So similarly, here we have like 11% uh, benefit is there. And the most important point is like after event-free survival, the patient will have recurrences. If you see, there is not much difference in the local regional recurrences in both the arms, even if you receive chemotherapy or chemoimmunotherapy. But if you look at the distant recurrences, the, there is a significant dip, uh, dip in the distant recurrence in the patients who received neoadjuvant immunotherapy plus chemotherapy. And especially the uh, dip is more in the CNS recurrences. So by giving this, we can prevent the uh, uh, distant recurrences. So and similarly, the four-year update, overall survival update, again, there was a 13% difference was there. If you look at the overall survival or if you look at the lung cancer specific survival, 13% difference was noted in the uh, overall survival at the four-year duration. So this is regarding the neoadjuvant, three cycles chemo plus immunotherapy followed by surgery. And next coming to the adjuvant trials, that is IM power 010. Here they have resect, uh, uh, taken like more than four centimeter tumor, underwent surgery, patient received four cycles chemotherapy, and then patient received atezolizumab for a duration of almost like one year, that is 16 cycles. This is the recently presented data at ASCO 2024. You can see uh, in patients with a T, uh, like PDL1 score more than 1%, there is almost 30 months difference in the median DFS. And you can see the hazard ratio was 0 0.7. And if you dissect further, in the patients with more than PDL1 more than 50, the hazard ratio was still better. That is, it was 0 0.48. And, but if you look, uh, include the all comers, like intent to treat population or all stage patients, the hazard ratio was not that great. So the take home point was like in adjuvant setting for the atezolizumab, the PD, if the PDL1 was more than 1%, the significant benefit, that is 30 months difference is there. And if it is more than 50%, still it is uh, very much benefit is there. And second trial was regarding the pembrolizumab, that is Keynote 091. Similarly, here the patient underwent surgery, and after that, patient chemotherapy was not mandatory, it is an optional thing, and patient was randomized to the pembrolizumab for almost one year. So there is a DFS benefit was there in the overall population, but surprisingly, with the patient who has a TPS score of more than 50, you can see the hazard ratio was lower side. When compared to the all comer, the patients with PDL1 more than 50% do not have a uh, significant benefit. So it is very hard to explain. That's why we cannot entirely rely on the PDL1 as a predictive biomarker. So this is an uh, overview. Uh, you can see like uh, IM Power and Keynote, both adjuvant trials. So this one is for the uh, atezolizumab and one is for the pembrolizumab arm. And one in one adjuvant chemotherapy is mandatory and another one it was considered. So atezolizumab was approved only for the PDL1 positive uh, patients, whereas in case of the uh, pembrolizumab was approved for the all comers. So these are the FDA uh, approvals. 
So these are the pros and cons of adjuvant and neoadjuvant immunotherapy. Why, why you should consider adjuvant or neoadjuvant therapy? For the adjuvant part, there is no delay or cancellation of the surgical approach. In neoadjuvant trial, only 80 to 85 percent of the patients underwent surgery. There is a risk that 15 percent of the patients will not proceed to the surgery because of the delays, cancellations or disease progression. That will not be there in the adjuvant part. There would be low tumor burden, eradication of the residual micrometastatic disease, flexibility in the time of therapy and longer treatment duration, restores the impaired anti-tumor immunity and information of the post-operative specimen before the treatment. These are the pros of the adjuvant part. Whereas the neoadjuvant part, we will have the high neoantigen load, early eradication of the micrometastatic disease, and then we will have the tumor downstaging, and we will have a progress card saying that, yeah, we have given this neoadjuvant immunotherapy part, and then patient underwent surgery, and you can monitor like what was happened to the uh, tumor. So these are some pros and cons of adjuvant and neoadjuvant uh, part. And then next, moving on to the keynote, there are multiple trials out there. I will just touch upon the keynote 671. So they have included stage 2, stage 3A, and stage 3B. Here you have to note in stage 3B, they have included only patients with N2 disease. That too, patient has an ipsilateral mediastinal or the subcarinal node. And then patient received four cycles of chemotherapy and along with the pembrolizumab, underwent surgery, and after that patient received pembrolizumab for a duration of nine months. There is an EFS benefit was there and the interim analysis of overall survival was also showed significant improvement. So FDA uh, given approval for stage 2 and stage 3 according to the AJCC 8th edition irrespective of the PDL one status. So these are the uh, options of immunotherapy in early stages, adjuvant, two trials, uh, adzolizumab for PDL one positive, pembrolizumab for all comers, neoadjuvant, uh, FDA approval for like more than 4 centimeter node positive tumors and perioperative multiple trials out there. But the practical implication was like when you should consider this periop or neoadjuvant or adjuvant and how many cycles if you want to give neoadjuvant, whether these three cycles or four cycles and what happened after giving this neoadjuvant and underwent surgery, whether you need to give the additional adjuvant therapy or not. Coming to the first question regarding periop, neoadjuvant or adjuvant. So this is a cross rail comp comparison. So you have to interpret it with caution. So my thing would be if you look at the hazard ratio for the EFS, the more or less it tends to be better for the perioperative regimen. Okay. But Again, I'm saying it is a cross, cross trial comparison. And the, but the downside of it with the perioperative regimen, you can see almost like 80 to 85% of the patients underwent surgery. So 15 to 20% of the patient did not turn up for surgery because of the multiple issues. But if you look at the adjuvant, 100% of the patients uh, upfront got for the surgery. But here also you can see only 84% of the patient has completed the adjuvant therapy. So in each and every regimen, there are certain downsides would be there. So looking at this and cross trial comparison, I tend to use perioperative regimen rather than the adjuvant thing. So which approach is best or is there a population that would uh, still benefit from surgery first or is there a biomarker that will allow us to risk stratify the patient? As I mentioned previously, PDL1 alone is not a marker to uh, is not a predictive marker uh, anymore, especially in the lung cancer because there are multiple uh, varied results over there. So next question, three or four cycles of neoadjuvant chemotherapy. You can see over here, some trials has used three cycles of uh, chemo immunotherapy, some trials, uh, cycles have used four, but there is not much difference in the paths here, uh, even if you increase the uh, number of cycles in the neoadjuvant setting. So the more cycles do not appear to be better uh, in terms of like neoadjuvant therapy. And the last question, what happens like additional adjuvant treatment after neoadjuvant? Do you really need to give this adjuvant part after completing neoadjuvant? A group may benefit, but we need to identify which group was that. If you compare these two trials, you can see in Keynote 671, patient who has achieved the pathological complete response, the survival difference was more. Event-free survival and even the uh, overall survival benefit is also tends to be more. So the patient who achieved paths here may be the group who can continue the adjuvant regimen. If the patient has not achieved paths here in the preoperative uh, by giving preoperative regimen, I don't think a point of continuing the same regimen in the adjuvant setting. So appears there may be a benefit for those without uh, major pathological response, less clear for those with major pathological response, but these are only exploratory endpoint and further research is warranted. So coming to the last slide, so which approach is better, whether it is neoadjuvant, adjuvant or perioperative, data appears to be support periom, but more lung data is especially needed. We have melanoma trial data, which was suggesting perioperative is better than the other things. But is there any population which will do better with surgery or any predictive biomarker re uh, requires re uh, further research? How many cycles of chemo uh, chemotherapy or immunotherapy in the near joint setting? No definitive answer, but current data definitely support that uh, more cycles are not definitely better. 
and adju additional adjuvant therapy, preliminary data suggests that a group may benefit, especially the group who achieves this pathological complete response. But definitely, the near adjuvant response adapted adjuvant therapy warrants the further research. Thank you.